Welcome everyone, and this lecture is going to go over design fundamentals for thermal considerations for ECE 3872, fall of 2020. Topics of this lecture, the influence of temperature, temperature range, high temperature operation, thermal modeling and design. First, we're going to look at the influence of temperature. Temperature range we can think of something like between negative 40 degrees C all the way up to 125 C. This is an example operating range. It can affect characteristics of the electronics. So as you change in temperature, the electronic characteristics will differ from what they are spec at. And most data sheets will have a table that will show where they're operating at over the different temperature ranges. Mechanical failures, though, can be in uh, a consequence if you drive the temperature too high or keep it at the higher end of the operation for too long. You can have a mechanical stress that causes failure. There's uh, also differences in different materials that are used inside the electronics. And the different temperatures can create stress between those two and th that'll result in cracking and failure. Running at a high temperature will accelerate this failure process material degra degradation, and eventually catastrophic failure. So let's think about something, uh, what it looks like inside a die stack. So in this, you can see that there are multiple layers, and each layer has a substrate that's connected it together. So there are bonding wires, pads, ball wires um, that connect everything together in this device. They're separated by adhesives, and usually these are pressure and heat sensitive. So when they're created, they're heated and compressed in pressure in order to create this compound. The whole stack will be encapsulated in a heat sink material to help draw off heat. So here's an ex example. This is from Xilinx, and here are temperature cycle testing results for a CMOS device specifically an ultra-scale FPGA. And you can see the stress conditions where the different temperature ranges and the lot quantity, the failure quantity, and the device quantity that they tested, and then the n total device cycles. So after this is when it was failing. So you can see the ultra-scale devices running at these temperature ranges, lot quantity 80, and they were able to cycle them 3,000 times through a heat and cool um, process. So different devices will last different lengths of time before they have this fail. If you think about how these structures are actually put together, there is the pad and then the intermetallic compound layer, which is what's actually putting the devices together. And so as this goes on, these are two different metal substances that are touching with the solder to hold it in place. And so as that gets heated and cooled and heated and cooled, stress FIREX will develop. So this is what they'll start to look like after a while when these components are starting to go into a failure mode. They will, you'll see tiny little cracks start to come through and as it heats and cools more and more and more. These cracks will get worse and worse. What this creates is a situation where it actually has to arc across that little chasm get to the other side. So it develops some potential, some capacitivity in order to um, go across. And that will also lead to a higher temperature because now it's actually happening to arc across that little chasm, therefore making it worse and accelerating the catastrophic fail event that will come. So if you think about a PCB, um, we have multiple layers and these layers have um, cores and then prefrag material and the way that these are made this is going back to this slide a couple you can think about this one they're made in the same way where the prefrag is glued and heated in order to form this stack up of the printed circuit cards in this when we have a via that's going through multiple of these layers those via the vias are lined so here is a drilled hole wall copper plating and the inner layer of foil. You can see that that crack forming right along that stress layer between the two, again, caused by that mechanical 
um, difference in material. Now, so those are some of the ways in which temperature can affect a component, can cause it to fail. Here's how we're going to look at a thermal interaction of a device. So we're going to assume that there's some large base plate. The base plate is going to be used to help take away the hot temperature, and that base plate is going to have a temperature of T naught, and eventually it will increase also. Then we have TC, TJ, the die, and the case. So the temp temperature of the case, temperature of the device, the die, and um, the case. So we're going to look at what happens and model these in an electrical sense. So heat flow is very similar to a DC current flow. So we can model all of these items as an electrical flow and use all our same circuit analysis procedures to do this. So consider that we have a block of um, material. It's going to have an area on the top, it's going to have a thickness, and then there's also going to be a temperature gradient over that device. So the thermal conductivity is a value that's going to go into calculating the thermal resistance. The thermal resistance we can then apply and you solve something um, using standard circuits. Here are some different materials. And so this is looking at the thermal conductivity, which is in the equation for the thermal resistance. And you can see they, they vary wildly depending on what they are. Um, if we look down here at glass, it has a 1 to a 6.2. And then if we come up here to um, some of the different gold and silver and copper alloys, we can see that they are sitting up here at a 406. So 406, if we put that into the thermal conductivity, that, that will make it a much smaller number. So here's how we can look at this as if it were an electrical equation. We can take some T naught, which if you recall back to this figure, T naught was the base plate temperature. And so that's going to act as a voltage supply. We're going to have two thermal resistances, the case junction temperature and the PCB temperature, the PCB thermal rating. And then the power dissipation can be considered as a current drive. So we can put this together in an equation in order to calculate what we're going to see as TJ, which is the device junction temperature. And this is what we're going to really be concerned about as we move forward, is how is this device going to be able to resolve this heat and dissipate the power? So this, we're thinking of it in a 1D structure. But in reality, it's actually a 2D continuum where we have heat that's applied and it will dissipate out through a device. So the area of the heat and the heat conduction path actually gets larger as it goes wider. So the area efficient, we can calculate using this equation and still put in in the same manner because this is just looking at the volume of the device. So if we now know how a device can fail, and if we can say we can look at this device and model it as a circuit, what can we do to get rid of heat once we use the circuit analysis structure in order to determine how much heat there is to get rid of? Well, there are three ways. Conduction, contact with a cool surface. So you are actually going to put it in direct contact with a uh, heat sink, with that base plate that's going to dissipate it, something of that type. Convection, we oftentimes see this in heat sinks where the heat sink, which is physically contacting the component, and then above that it's going to have a bunch of fins. The fins allow the air to pass through it and move air by convection away. And then there's radiation. Radiation is out into space. So we have a device that's sitting in a box with stagnant airflow, and that heat is just going to radiate out into the box. That is usually negligible. So for the types of heat sources that we're talking about in electronics, 
we need something much more hands-on to deal with this heat. So when you're designing your PCB, when you're designing your components, part placement on the PCB is very important. You need to know where that part is going. You need to know where the dissipation paths are going to be. You also need to think about if you have multiple high heat components, don't put them all right next to each other. You might need to put them on separate PCBs or keep them apart from each other on the PCBs in order to allow for it to, you, to dissipate the heat. You can also um, use that PCB. You can put layers in the PCB specifically to try to sink heat to and help to dissipate it. Then our normal standbys, heat sink, and if the heat sink fails or is not enough, then you can put a fan on it actually cool that heat sink but really we want to try to avoid fans if at all possible because they are noisy they take a lot of maintenance they fail very quickly and if we have done our thermal analysis with a fan and that fan degrades or fails or gets blocked um, we could damage our electronics very quickly so how can we do something like this using a pcb in order to increase the heat dissipation so here's an example of a transistor and it it's accompanying PCB and you can see the footprint the footprint of this copper is much larger than the actual device the actual device is the black component and then you can see the copper pads and you can see how large this main pad is so this is an example that we can go through and calculate if you think for um, 0.8 millimeters thickness for the FR4, assuming no other con, uh, conduction path. So this is it. The area effective of this heat dissipation source is going to be the 2.4 measured from the top of this pad plus 1.6 plus 4 plus 1.6 plus uh, 1.5 1.6 uh, plus 1 plus 1.6. And so we can see that this gives us an area, area of volume that is going to be underneath here through the thickness of this device in order to dissipate the heat into this area of uh, 30.5 millimeters squared. If we put this into the equation in order to calculate the um, thermal resistance, we can look at the table and obtain the um, thermal coefficient, copper. We use the area uh, effective area, and then the thickness, the 0 0.8 millimeter thickness, to obtain the overall thermal resistance. This gives us the ability then to look at this now as a circuit and determine the amount of heat that this area of copper can dissipate. And that is going to be 238 degrees Celsius per watt. So that is the units that are going to be applied to this um, thermal resistance. So we're going to have to multiply that by the wattage of the device in order to calculate the amount of heat. PCB via array to conduct heat. So in this manner, we are just putting on the very top a block of copper. We're just putting on this pad of copper. Now let's say that instead of doing that, we want to actually take and put it down through the PCB into a different layer in order to help get rid of it. So we're making a greater mass of copper just by connecting all of these vias, even if it's not going to a different layer. These vias are going to just increase the volume of copper that's touching this pad. So if we look at this illustration, we can see again, there is a lot of mass of copper here. And so you can see, depending on the size of the matrix of vias contained in that, the via pitch, the thermal resistance goes pretty quickly. So we can see if we don't have any vias, we're going to be sitting at a 15.9 degree C per watt. But if we have an 11 by 11 uh, matrix of vias, 
we're going to be at 1.5. So the difference is a tenfold difference. So see here it's a 0% reduction, and here's a 90% reduction in the uh, thermal resistance. So very strong just by adding vias into the PCB. And what this does is allows for that larger thermal mass for, from, from the vias, the copper of the vias. Like I said, heat sinks. This is probably something that everybody has seen. Well, now we're going to take that idea of a thermal resistance and we're going to go further. So we're going to start off by having the junction temperature and then the TC, which is going to be pulled from the case. So these arrows are just illustrating where on this device it is. But if we were doing the thermal analysis, this would be a series of resistors that we would calculate the sum of. So the TC is the case, and then the T of the heat sink, and then the ambient air temperature. So as you're doing this calculation, you have to look at each degree of separation from where you're at. And the ambient air temperature can be cooled further. And so the R of the heat sink to the um, ambient air resistance, that is going to depend a lot on the number of fins on this heat sink. And a this is usually given in the data sheet. Conductive surface with fins, convection, effective as a heat exchanger. So the fan can be used to add more cooling if you need it. So here is an example of how you can combine heat sinks and fans. So you can look at the difference in the temperature. The base plate temperature rise from ambient delta T. Um, the power dissipated divided by the air density. So this varies by altitude, but for the most part, you can assume that this is pretty near um, uh, 1.18. And then the airflow rate, this is specified on the fan. So every fan will have an airflow rate. The cross-sectional area, meters per square, uh, squared meters, this is very similar to what we were talking about earlier with the resistance. You need to find the area of the device. And then the specified heat of the air. So this is, again, going back to the, like the ambient air temperature. So the problems with fan, periodic maintenance, cleaning of the dust filters, lubrication, bearing replacement, often these are the least reliable component in the system. So they go out often, and this is a major problem if your fan goes out. Um, this is the number one thing that kills computer systems is when their fans start to go out. So other thermal devices, the, the top, these are heat pipes. They actually contain a liquid inside them. The heat will cause the liquid to turn into air. It travels down where it hits the cooling device. And at the cooling device, in the heat sink, it will cool and it will condense and drop back down. And so it will create this convectionary current inside the heat tubes, the heat pipes. Liquid coolers, you can combine the wonderful efficiency of a fan now with a liquid. If you have to go to this degree, make sure you have done a lot of research because now you're getting into a very big, tricky problem where you're con uh, combining a liquid with moving air with electrical components. So, um, but this is a solution that's oftentimes used in higher power computer cases. You can find liquid cooled cases. Um, thermoelectric coolers, uh, Peltier coolers, these are called uh, TE coolers is another name. These are great. What you can use, you can actually use these in one of two directions depending on how you apply the voltage. On one side, you can use these as a heater, and on the other side, it'll be cold. And then if you reverse the polarity, it will actually reverse that transfer of heat. So what this does is it transfers heat from one side to another. This type of device is extremely useful, extremely power hungry. I've used these before where we were in very nasty environmental uh, conditions, and we needed to keep a box cool, but we didn't want to open it up to the uh, thermal currents, the air currents. 
because it was in an extremely dusty, nasty environment. And so we put one of these on an extremely large heat plate and it would pull the heat out of the box real well. So they're great, but they're power hungry, they're expensive, um, but they work very well. So here's an example of some of these different things being used combined. Here's a heat pipe. This is a Dell laptop. Here's a heat pipe connected to the frame. The fans that are pulling the heat, putting it into the heat pipe, and then on this, the battery is bolted in place on the frame in a lot of different places, a lot more than you need. This is actually creating more of that hard connection and also another thermal path down. If you are going to test, and for our devices, everybody's going to need to look at their uh, devices and make sure they're not going over, over temperature. There's a couple of ways. Thermistors are little um, sensors that you can get and connect to it. And these are oftentimes you can glue them on and use them for the time being and then remove them at the end. Or a lot of products actually have this built into it. A lot of processors will have a temperature sensor inside the processor. IR sensors, this is very, very, these are very, very, very common in laboratory environments. And this is what we will be using to test your product. We will just have an IR sensor gun that will put onto the hottest components on the board and they get a temperature reading. You just point them at it and it's a no contact. An IR camera, infrared camera, this can give you the heat gradient. And if it's calibrated right, you can see at any point in this picture what the temperature is. And then there's also contact probes where you can actually physically touch and hook it up to the device to output the temperature. So IR cameras, here's how these work. They're, they're a different material um, that will absorb different amounts of heat. So, you know, these are great, but they're really expensive. And then software and thermal management. As I said, a lot of processors will actually have built-in um, thermal sensors. And so they will monitor that. And if, if it starts to get too hot, the processor will just start to power down and reduce efficiency in order to save heat. All right, reliability and temperature are intimately related. So as we saw at the very beginning, as temperature gets higher, as those two different materials are coming into contact, the high temperatures will cause them to break down quicker. In order to look at this in our systems, we can use equivalent DC circuits to estimate the temperature between each of the junctions of our device. Once we understand the estimated temperature, then we can go and do some thermal management techniques, conduction, convection, forced air. By using these, we can bring our temperature down into the range of the data sheet to make sure that we don't cause damage or shorten the life of a component. That is all for this lecture. Um, see you in class.